And it looks like we are live. Got to give the, the stream just a second to breathe so that John, uh, the wannabes behind the scenes, can make sure that we're good to go with the, uh, the Facebook group. Pausing just a second here. And it looks like we are... There we go. There we're good to go. Mile high. Hello, everybody in Broncos country. Welcome into another episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. I'm your host, Lance Sanderson. And joining me, as per usual, is my good friend and colleague and Mile High Huddle's senior NFL draft analyst, the one and only Eric Trickle. Eric, what's up, my dude? How are you doing? Doing pretty good and doing pretty good. I mean, it's been a been an interesting week, but uh, excited to be here talking about football especially after all the stuff that's been going on this week with all the news, Sam Darnold to the Panthers, Teddy Bridgewater, is he the guy? Like just, there's just a lot of news and uh, we're excited to step away from the quarterback room a little bit tonight. The quarterback conversation going to be talking about corners, which I know that uh, a, a lot of fans don't realize that we may not still need a, uh, a corner, but with the contracts of Kyle Fuller and Ronald Darby and still being unsure what's going to happen with Michael Ojemudia, and even the contract with Bryce Gallen, corner can still be seen pretty early. So we're going to have a good friend of the podcast on to be talking about corners and talking about my uh, my latest and final version of the mock draft, really. Yeah, man, it, it, this is actually a pretty interesting mock draft. I cannot wait to get into it, man. But it's been it's just been one of those hectic kind of days for me. I've been running around all over town. I've been home for oh about. 45 minutes now um, had the home inspection on the house that we put the offer in on. So it, everything looks to be in, in fine order. We're going to go over that. Um, my dad is actually a home inspector. So he's the one that came and did it. Um, so I'm gonna, looking forward to hanging out with those guys so they can hang out with the grandkids um, and being able to go over the house that we're trying to buy and everything like that. So really exciting stuff here in the Sanderson household, but I haven't actually got a chance to really sit down and relax, but guys, before we get into anything else here, um, got to give a shout out to our presenting sponsor of, of tonight's show manscape guys 2021 we're well into into april the draft is right around the corner um and it's actually going to be live. So if you're looking to maybe go out and uh, head out to, I believe Cleveland is where the draft is at this year, um, and and make sure you're you're well kept and and well groomed and ready to go out and have a, a good night. The easiest way to get yourself back uh, out of that quarantine funk is to go to Manscaped.com. Manscaped has precision engineered tools for everything with your face or below the belt, whatever you want to do with them. Um, they're high quality stuff here, guys. Eric, what do you got for us today? Well, as always, I have what they call the shed. It's a little travel bag. If you guys do a lot of traveling, this has actually worked perfectly. It's nice, perfect size for all your toiletries and anything else that you need to take with you. I've got the deodorant that they have that you just, it's like a little lotion, lotion deodorant, basically. A, uh, a what's called the crop reviver. It's a, it's a toner for down there. And of course, as always, I've got the lawnmower 3.0 in this special little bag that it comes into which is really simple and easy to use. I mean, one of the best things about it, it's got the little light because when you're doing stuff down there, you don't want to nick anything. So that extra lighting is always, always beneficial. But yeah, super easy to use. They have a lot of good products. They have a pair of boxer briefs that are super soft, super comfortable to wear, and just a lot of good products that are just great accessories for men to have. Yeah, and one of the best things about the the lawnmower here is that they've got these interchangeable blades. They just pop right off, um, and you can you can replace the blade on it, and it, it helps to keep everything from getting nicked downstairs. So, um, and I use I use mine for my beard. It, it, my wife appreciates it because it doesn't get all prickly and nasty. It doesn't get all long and unkempt, and I, I look good all the time. And Manscaped does a great job with everything. They have the, those boxer briefs, though. I'm telling you, those boxer briefs, the most comfortable pair of underwear you're ever gonna wear. I swear. Um, they're they're nice and light. They're very soft. Um, they move around very well. They don't scrunch up and, and get uncomfortable. But seriously, guys, check out manscaped.com. And if you guys use the promo code HUDDLE, you're going to get 20% off and you're going to get free shipping on anything you order at manscaped.com. I got my stuff the other day uh, a couple weeks ago, um, and it was like uh, 120 bucks for the performance package that they have, which includes the lawnmower. It includes the weed whacker, which is the nose hair and the ear trimmer, a couple of different deodorants and those boxer briefs and the shed as well. Uh, it's like 120 bucks. If you use the promo code Huddle, drops it down to less than 100 bucks, and you and you save on the free shipping. So again, guys, Manscaped.com. Use the promo code huddle, promo code Huddle for 20 percent off and free shipping. Your wife and your boys, they're gonna thank you. They're gonna appreciate that. So make sure you guys go and, and check that out if you ever get the chance. Now, Eric, before we we bring Luke on 
You just dropped this seven-round mock draft that you did for the Denver Broncos. And I got to say, there's some very interesting things here. You have the Broncos trading down not only once, but twice. What is your thinking behind this? And why why exactly did you go in this direction? Well, it's actually simple. I've said for a while, and I've said it a couple times on the show, that George Payton, he comes from the Minnesota Vikings, who have a big belief of draft using draft ammo the more picks you have the more chances you have a hit they believe in this shotgun type approach to the draft the last two years they've had uh they had 15 picks in the draft last year and the the year before that they had like like 10 or 11 and the year before that they had 13 it's been just out a large number of draft picks they believe in this shotgun effect and i believe that part of that will carry over to george payton in here with denver and the biggest thing is, is I, I wanted to move up for a quarterback. I use, I always use the Draft Network's draft simulator. And unfortunately, I, Mac Jones is the only quarterback left. I couldn't get up to four. They, it would have taken me three firsts and the two seconds. And that's way too much. I mean, I make a big deal about selling the farm because nobody ever defines what that means. To me, that is selling the farm. Yeah. Wasn't going to do that. And uh, so I, I didn't do it. I ended up being at nine. Got to nine. There was nobody there that I really valued there. All the Rashawn Slater was gone. Penny Sewell was gone. Um, Waddle, Chase, they were both there. Kyle Pitts was gone. So there was nobody worth valuing. I don't think Micah Parsons on play alone, he's not worth a top 10 pick to me. He's not worth a top 15 pick. I mean, this he's not a coverage linebacker. He's an athlete for yeah. sure, but he he struggles in coverage. So I just decided, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to sit there and see what was there. And I remember that I was offered a trade to, I believe, Chicago, which is where it was, moving down to 20. And I used the trade with that Denver had with Pittsburgh a couple years ago. They ended up moving up the, in the simulator. They took Mac Jones and then got to 20, let it simulate again. And still nobody was there that I really valued at pick 20. So, again, I moved down a second time, this time targeting Green Bay's pick at 29. They And I used a draft th- uh, from another draft trade from 2019 – that involved Green Bay moving up to 21 with the Baltimore Ravens. And I used that kind of for the basis of the trade and managed to get it done and decided to go. And uh, I'm a firm believer that you some, that you draft for future needs. And to me, edge next year is a big need. And that's a position, especially is a position where you draft to fill the need before it's actually a need. So I went and got Jason Owe out of Penn State. Yeah, and man, you you guys want to talk about uh, an an absolute freak athlete? I don't remember exactly what he measured, but I know that he ran like a four three six or a four three eight forty at like two hundred and sixty five pounds or something like that. Just ridiculous, incredible athlete. Um, everyone wants to point to the uh, the lack of production with him at Penn State. Uh, he only had seven total sacks in three seasons, including zero this last year. But Eric, you had an interesting stat about Jason Oway. I think you said it was uh, one. Every- Every seven or eight pass rush snaps, he would get a pressure. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? It was actually one every eight point five five. Okay, he got a pass. Uh, he got a pressure on it, and actually, there's a video of it up on YouTube that I talk about that a little bit. And I compare him. I believe Shaq Barrett was one I compared, and he, Shaq Barrett was averaging a pressure every like six point something. I compared him to Bradley Chubb, which was every seven point something, and Malik Reed, which was every eleven point something or twelve point something. And so there's this huge, there's this big issue of what, why didn't these uh, pressures translate into sacks? And that's something that I think with some more development with his technique that he's got to get down, that you'll see this. He is a compare, he is very comparable to Daniel Hunter out of, uh, out of, that was, is with the Minnesota Vikings that George Payton was there with. And there's been a lot of smoke going around that the real reason why George Payton was at the Penn State Pro Day wasn't for Micah Parsons, that it was Mm -hmm. for Jason Owe. So I could see it, and that's part of the reason why I went there. I think at 29, it's good value for him, betting on his upside, having him work under Von Miller for a year, learning from him, because Von Miller has been very vocal about how he helps the younger players, how he helped Malik Reed, how he helped Bradley Chubb, and I think he would help Jason Owe as well. And a lot of what Von Miller does, if Jason Owe picks it up, he can be he can be a great edge rusher in the NFL. You just got to pick it up, and at that point, I think it's a bet worth a, a, a risk worth taking. Right. And uh, something that we always talk about here, and this goes back to the Micah Parsons thing about him not being a, a coverage linebacker. Um, the the thing about Jason Owe is he, and 
before I get into that, uh, is athleticism doesn't always mean coverage ability, especially at, at, with bigger guys. Yeah, you can be a, a, a freak athlete, run 4-3-8, and still not be able to drop and hit your landmarks in coverage. Um, Jason Owe, well, I didn't see a whole lot of that when I was watching him. I was also really focused on Micah Parsons because, man, he's fun to watch. But Jason Owe, I think there is enough uh, athleticism and vertical sink in his hips that he can drop back and get and hit those landmarks and, and really play in that Von Miller coverage role that Vic Fangio likes to use him in or like a similar role with what they did with uh, Leonard Floyd or even like an Alden Smith back when he was in San Francisco. Um, they're not going to do it a lot, but he still has the ability to be able to do that and he can grow and develop. I mean, this guy's only been playing football for a handful of years now. He only started playing football as a junior in high school. I just heard this on Sirius NFL radio the uh, uh, earlier today, actually. Um, he actually wanted to be a basketball player. So there's some more athleticism there than you actually think that there is. Um, and when he, when he really figured out that his, like he hit that, that final part of his growth spurt at six, five and two sixty five, he's not going to be big enough to play the center or the power forward position in basketball. So he actually switched over and started playing football and became a dynamic, dynamic edge rusher. And now, the, I mean, we're talking about him in the first round. He's only been playing football for five years total. So there, there's something to work with with Jason Oway. I actually do really like this pick. I, I think, and as you said, it's a future need. And something that the Broncos are desperately going to need is a, a future edge rusher. And like you said, let him develop behind Von Miller and get some extra coaching and then also have a Batman on the other side. Because I think that Bradley Chubb still has some growing to do as well. And he's going to get into that Batman kind of a role. At Penn State, yeah, he did, he only had he didn't have any sacks this year. But on the other side, he had Shaka Tony, who we're not even sure is actually an edge defender. He might be an off-ball linebacker at the next level. So you got to have a Batman on the other side, and yeah, that doesn't necessarily ring uh, ring great for Jason Owe. But at the same time, to have another person that can take some of that pressure away from him on the other side of the field might actually turn into some more opportunities. Now, guys, we're not going to break down this entire mock draft. We're going to move this forward just a little bit. Um, there's some some more things. Go to Mile High Hub. Com. Check it out. Um, it's a great read. I read through it earlier. There's some more questions I have for Eric here. And the next one is um, we, did, we decided to do a player that I really liked. Um, and the, the one that it's going to be is Javante Williams, the running back from North Carolina. And Eric, you got him in the trade down. Um, you picked him. I think you used the the pick that you got from Chicago, number fifty two overall, to go and uh, get Javante Williams. The value there is tremendous. Why don't you break him down just a little bit for us? Well, I really wasn't expecting him to be there. I th figured that he would be gone by that point. And he's just a guy who he can do a little bit of everything for your offense. And there's been enough smoke linking the Broncos to wanting a Najee Harris or uh, Travis Etienne or even Javante Williams to sit there and consider it when he was there. And I looked at other players on the board. A couple of them are like, okay, I, I kind of want to take them here. But I felt that I had another second round pick that was coming up. So I just kind of took a shot and see if they would sit there and fall to that point. And they managed to fall there. So I, and I took the running back. I mean, this is a guy who he could do a lot for you. Denver lost Philip Lindsay. We don't know if Melvin Gordon will actually still be with the Broncos come this season because of his legal issues and everything like that, Denver may still decide to part ways. I think that's the unlikely pathway, but whatever the case is after this year, he's a free agent. And I don't think he's back. Royce Freeman is a free agent after this year. And he's never lived up to being that third round pick. And who else do they have? They have Levante Bellamy, who I liked coming out, but he hasn't done anything yet. They don't have anybody there. And Javante Williams, he can be that lead guy in this offense yeah. at running back and just be a, just another weapon. I mean, in this mock, no first round quarterbacks. It's they're rolling with Drew Locke again, help better that run game to help take the try and take the pressure off of him so he can try to flip it around and become something. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with you on that one. The, the, the running back position is, a, is actually a big need to me. I, oh, I, I, I go ahead. And I forgot about Mike Boone, but I mean, this was a guy who was the number three back in Minnesota. I'm not expecting a big role for him. Yeah, I, I actually agree with you on that one. Um, he's going to be more special teams player. He's actually a very high quality special teams player, and that's really what they signed him for. Um, he, he is Philip Lindsay a little bit with with a bigger side. Uh, that's not the best way to say that. Uh, he's a lesser version of Melvin Gordon. Let's just say that. Big size, uh, decent receiver out of the backfield, can move around a little bit. Um, not the greatest athlete. He has a couple of long runs, but it's more uh, just hitting the hole right. Um, better vision, I think, as well. But uh, Boone is not necessarily going to be a, a huge player. He's going to be more rotational back. And to go and get a, a true bell cow that you can get, that well, that you can groom into a bell cow and Javante Williams, let him grow behind uh, – 
behind Melvin Gordon. I, I love this pick. Uh, something that's so underrated about Javante Williams is his receiving ability. He's such a good receiver on those angle routes and the circle routes out of the backfield. Does a good job out in the flat as well. Um, open space when he can actually run and get downhill on a, on a cornerback or a safety. It, it, he's a very violent runner. Something that I don't necessarily like about him is even though he's a violent runner at the second level, I didn't necessarily like him in short yarded situations. Now, I might be completely wrong on that, but it just didn't seem, and that, that might be a part of the North Carolina offensive line, um, not necessarily open up holes in the short, short area situations. Um, he has a nose for the end zone and in goal line situations, he'll actually power it through. But there are a lot of third and ones and fourth and ones that I saw watching him where he was stuffed in the backfield. So it's it's a, a very weird dynamic to me because I do think that there's some physicality to him. You get a, a better offensive line in front of him, he can actually be really good. Now, uh, another to close this out before we get Luke here, uh, the pick that I don't necessarily like and it's only because I like this safety class so much. And I haven't got a chance to watch this kid out of Indiana. You took in the third round in Jamar Johnson. Now, Eric, we got to watch just a little bit of him uh, against Justin Fields. We had a late rotation. Um, it looked like cover three. They kind of trapped underneath, uh, rotated across, and made an interception early in the game. Why Jamar Johnson here and not a guy like an Andre Cisco or um, Ardarius Washington maybe? Well, I think that at that point, Ardarius Washington is just a little bit too rich. And for Andre Cisco, he wasn't on the board. Okay. That, that, so that, it's really that simple. And to me, Jamar Johnson, he's up there in contention for number two safety, number three safety. He's right there with it. I think he's better than Richie Grant, which I know you have issues with. But this guy, he can do a lot. And he just he just hasn't gotten talked about. I liked, started liking him in, I think it was January. Dane Brugler of The Athletic started tweeting out about him, sending clips and everything. And I was like, this is interesting. Like, I wanted to check him out. Checked him out. Really liked what he uh, what he was able to what he was doing, what he was offering up, and that Fields tape against Ohio State mm -hmm. was outstanding. He baited Justin Fields quite a bit, which that was Justin Fields' worst game. And if you have concerns about him being an NFL quarterback, that's a good game to point to. But uh, yeah, I like what he can bring. I view him as a has more range, not quite as consistent of a tackler or coming downhill, but he's a different style of Justin Simmons. I guess would be the best way to put it. Okay. With that extra range and everything. And I think that pairing him next to Justin Simmons, kind of filling in that Kareem Jackson rule, I think can work. I think you're going to have to make a little bit of adjustments because Kareem Jackson does so well coming downhill and Jamar Johnson doesn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the only hiccup. Outside of that, he's a perfect scheme fit. He fits in extremely well this year as a number three safety. It's just, oh, it's just, I, to me, it's just such a good pick for them. And at this point, I couldn't pass it up. He's a guy that I value in the second round. And here he was. And I wanted to take him earlier, but because of other players that I felt were a little bit more needs, and he shouldn't draft for needs by any means, but I kind of was here uh, with a couple picks that he just kind of continued to fall for me, and it worked out. Okay. No, it, I mean, I, I get the reasoning. I need to go back and watch him some more. I haven't really got a chance to check him out. So, and again, I love the safety class and to find another guy that you're really high on. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take that opportunity here probably in the next couple of days and, and really go watch some more Indiana tape, especially that, that fields tape as well. Um, I we'll we'll get into that here in just a few minutes. I want to get to these super chats really fast. Um, John, do you have Muhammad ready to go at, uh, no, we got Richard Anthony coming in here first with the $5 super chat. We appreciate you, uh, Rich for joining us. How long will Dennis, Denver uh, give Drew Locke if he isn't productive by the fourth game. Um, mile high huddle for life. Um, I don't know. It just depends on the level of competition that they bring in with him. Um, if they if they go get uh, Jamar or Jamar uh, uh, Justin Fields or a uh, a Trey Lance or something like that, and bring in some stiff competition by the fourth game, I mean, why wouldn't you want to see that first round if if it's not looking great? But if they go and get like a Davis Mills or a Kellen Mond day two, day, two, day three kind of a thing. Um, I, I think you might let him roll it out just a little bit and see if he can can come back around and, and pick things up. Um, if it's a veteran, I'm not necessarily sure he even makes it to the fourth game, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, Gardner Minshew might meet him out in, in camp. Eric, what do you think? Um, I think that if, unless Denver gets a quarterback in the first round, I think that Drew Locke's going to be given the starting job. They want to see if they can sit there and recoup that second round uh, pick that they invested in him. See if they can't basically get him to become something. If he's not productive by the fourth game, I think that they'll probably give him probably a couple more games, probably week six, week seven, maybe week eight, somewhere around there mm -hmm. before deciding to uh, 
to pull the plug and decide to move on from there and go to whoever happens to be the backup quarterback at that time, whether it be Gardner Minshew, Nick Foles, Teddy Bridgewater, who knows, who, whatever it is, I think that's about where it will. I do think that he has a short leash, and if he doesn't show it early, there's no excuses. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you on that one. You all know how I feel about Drew Locke anyways. We're not going to go down that road again. Uh, John, I'm going to let you pull up Muhammad's super sticker. I'm going to say hello to the rest of the chat while you do that. Um, say hello to George Newton, Harold Richard jumping in here. Uh, Muhammad Badri jumping in with a $1.99 donation and the microphone. Yes, we spit into the microphone on this podcast and tell you nothing but the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Uh, Bawana always behind the keys, uh, dropping everything down. Muhammad again, Thomas Servo, uh, Robert Kitchens as well. Spicy Mike jumping in here. Darab Qureshi on YouTube as well. Uh, let's see if I can find some Facebook guys here. We have uh, John Libick joining in. Good evening, fellas. Hope all is well with you. Good evening, John. Thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Um, Esteban Rivas jumping in here as well on Facebook. Uh, Rolando Vela jumping in here as well. What's going on, guys? Thank you all for joining the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Let's let's just get this out of the way right now and get this get this conversation going with with at Coach Luke Polglaze. Luke, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show, man. It's it's great to have you. Uh, Luke is the wide receivers coach at Kenyon College still. Correct, yes, sir. Yeah, at Kenyon College, uh, coming in here to talk some cornerbacks the cornerbacks we, we, we uh lined out luke to come on the show um the broncos had not hit free agency yet and we had not seen kyle fuller get signed we didn't see ronald darby get signed and we were going to talk about some of these draft cornerbacks because we figured you know as a wide receivers coach who else would be able to scout these cornerbacks the best and highlight some of their strengths and weaknesses other than coach luke polglaze luke how you doing buddy i'm doing well thanks guys for having me back it's it's been a while. Um, you, you guys are going to have to forgive me if I sound a little bit croaky at times. We uh, we had practice earlier today, and I'm definitely a bit of a yeller at practice. So when you have to yell through through a couple of masks, you, you have to yell a little bit louder. But um, I appreciate you guys having me. It's great to be back. Yeah, man. It, it's it, it's just, always great to have you. I just want to point out something you said. You said, who el- who better to have on than a wide receiver coach? Probably a defensive backs coach. <laughs> well, so talking I mean, about corners would probably better have on, but we can settle for Luke. I mean, I, I yeah, I did say that, but at the same time, when you're scouting against, uh, if as a wide receiver coach and you're scouting <laughs> against cornerbacks and looking for these weaknesses and looking for what they do well and how to attack those cornerbacks, yeah, you would you would like to get a cornerbacks coach to be able to come on and and join the show and and break down what they do well. But I'm kind of curious as to see what Luke has to say negative about these guys. No, I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> but before we get into it, Luke, I really do want to kind of pick your brain just a little bit though. Um, when when you're watching film and you're watching these cornerbacks cornerbacks that you're going to go against what are the biggest things that you're really working for like what are the traits that you're looking to target and go against um what are the ones that that speak out to you the most as are the most important in scouting cornerbacks and uh how do you go about attacking those weaknesses yeah definitely well i think at the college level you know much less so than at the pro level we really have to focus on scheme you know what is what is the coverage that they'll play to us to any given formation or to any given personnel and um, you know for us we know that we're going to get you know probably on any given team five to six defensive backs at most on the field you know for us at, at the college level at the d3 level we're going to get a lot of four maybe five defensive back sets So for us, you know, it's looking at coverage and then it's looking at individual players. How can we position our best players to take advantage of mismatches against other guys? You know, effectively, you know, you can think of offense almost just distilling down to find the most limited athlete or find the guy who has to do the most in the defensive scheme and pick on that guy, you know, throw a bunch of different things at him and see how he responds. You know, when I'm scouting players, hip flexibility is a huge one. Are they fluid? Can they transition quickly? You know, if it's a safety, you know, how does he react to vertical routes? How is he going to react if he has switch routes? Um, You know, the big thing, especially for us kind of from an offensive perspective, do the do the corners tackle in the run game, you know, cause anytime you can, you know, effectively block the box and run on a corner or run on the safety, that's a huge win for the offense because you're, you're taking your running back every day in that one-on-one matchup. Um, so it's a variety of things, you know, at our level, it's, it's a lot of scheme based things um, coverage based things, but I'm sure, you know, when it gets to the NFL, having talked to a couple of league guys, it really is, you know, finding distinct tells or finding little weaknesses about each individual player. 
Awesome. Um, so speaking of that scheme versatility, um, is that something that goes into uh, into your evaluation of a player as well? Um, and it, it, this can even go into the the wide receiver or even the running back running backs position, which you have uh, which you've you've coached as well. Does uh, does scheme versatility mean something to you if you're going to like place a grade on a player, or uh, are you just looking for better athletes and better traits? Yeah, it varies. Um, you know, when you talk about running backs specifically, one thing that that I really look at when you you know when you scout a running back, you know, be at the high school, the college level, is lateral agility. You know, that's one thing that you can have a guy who's not the fastest guy in a straight line, but if he if he can make that jump cut, if he can make that one cut in the box and and get out of there, then you know then you've got a successful running back on your hands. Um, so yeah, there are certainly traits that you're going to look for, you know, more than others, um, you know, faster, you know, agile athletic receivers, you know, if, if you get them in high school or in college and they're not necessarily, you know, the most advances in terms of having a toolbox of releases, that's fine because you're going to gamble on yourself as a coach to be able to get those guys, the skills they need. Same thing in the NFL. I guarantee you that there are guys out there who are great athletes uh, but may not necessarily be coached in college to fit exactly your scheme. And that's fine because if they're a great athlete, if you talk to them and you know they understand their keys and they understand what they're doing on any assignment, then you're going to bring them in, you're going to coach them up, and you're going to turn them into a great football player. And that's what you have to gamble on as a coach and as an evaluation staff. Yeah. Now, I kind of want to take that before we get to breaking down these players and kind of bring it into this question from Malcolm Brown, who is one of the fellow Alaskans that happens to be in the chat. So, Malcolm, it's always good to see you in here. And he says, should Peyton, George Peyton, the new general manager of the Broncos, prioritize the ceiling or the floor of players? Now, I'd be curious to think, to hear your thoughts on that, Luke, of should it, with him being at first time, after spending so much time with the Minnesota Vikings, should he prioritize the ceiling or the floor, floor on these players? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think a lot of it depends on your team and where you're at, you know, in the standings or where you're looking, you know, projecting yourself to be next year. Um, for me as a coach, I'm always going to say, give me the guy with the higher ceiling. Um, unless he is like a much, much, much lower floor. I'm just going to say, you know what, this guy has amazing potential and I'm going to gamble on myself as a coach to help him to reach that potential. Um, you know, just thinking back a couple of years, a guy like Robert Kandiche, right? Super athletic yeah. freak not as polished as a football player, you're going to have teams that look at a guy like that and say, look, this guy could be an amazing football player. And we think we have a great staff in position to be able to develop this guy into a pro bowl or, or even an all pro player. Um, and that doesn't always work out like in the case of Robert Kandice, right? But you know, it's that, it's that exchange of, do you want a guy who's going to walk in day one and be an amazing football player? We talked about this last year, right? We talked about Jerry Judy being probably the most pro ready receiver in that class. But other guys, um, was it Ruggs who ended up with the Raiders? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. A guy like Ruggs has probably a higher ceiling than Jerry Judy because athletically he's quick, he's fast, he's hard to cover. But he's probably not going to have that same impact early on in the NFL that a guy like Jerry Judy will, who's incredibly polished, great releases, great toolbox, and is just, you know, he's an incredibly advanced technical route runner. So it's a trade off because I think you can't just exclusively prioritize floor or you're going to have a lot of OK players who they're never going to be bad, but they're just going to be you know, game managers and, and who wants a game manager at right guard. Um, and, you know, you, you don't want a, a team built of guys with high ceilings because you could end up with a lot of busts. And, you know, that thing, that's one thing about being a general manager is you have to evaluate, okay, where do we, where do we need our floor to be? We need to bring in guys who are going to have that floor who can, who can, you know, fill gaps for us while also, you know, listening to the coaching staff banging down your door saying, hey, give us the high ceiling guys. We're going to coach them up. We're going to make them amazing players. It's it's not an easy job. And that's why there's only 32 guys who do it every year. <laughs> yeah. And on that is, I mean, I say, I've said it on here before is team, coaches, especially they would rather have the better athlete than the football player because you can't teach athleticism. You can teach them how to play football. And we see that time and time again every single year. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And when it comes to Denver, in my opinion, I don't think you want to prioritize either one exactly, but you want to look at both. And kind of what, if I understood Luke right with what he was saying, is you kind of want to sit there and have a minimum for their floor and still reach for that high ceiling uh, player, especially for a team that just won five games, for a team that's unsure what they're going to have at the quarterback a team that's unsure what they're going to have on offense is that you just kind of have this balance. 
Now, trying to transition transition this over to the cornerbacks that we're talking about, just which corner do you think has probably the – probably would be the safest, I guess, the highest floor but the lowest ceiling? Yeah, and and part of this, I think, really depends on scheme and depends what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, and, and so much of that is tricky because in college, you're not going to have a lot of teams – you know, in the NFL, you'll have schemes that are devoted to man, right? You'll have entire teams that are known for a man scheme. You'll have entire teams like the Seahawks that are just a cover three team um, and that, you know, they wouldn't know cover two if they bumped into into an, into an alley. You know, like there's there's different things like that. So um, part of it depends because you're going to be drafting guys based on their athletic profile and based on what you think they can accomplish um, in terms of kind of the safest bet. You know, really one guy who I was really impressed with was Greg Newsom um, from Northwestern. You know, is he the best tackler in the world? No, um, he, he needs a lot of work with that. He kind of ducks his head. He kind of throws his shoulder, but he's willing to tackle. He's super aggressive. He comes up to the flat and makes plays. He attacks the ball like he when he is backpedaling, he can click and close and just shoot out of a cannon. Um, you know, he knows his keys. He's well coached. He understands what he does. You know, he does a good job of getting over the top of the routes. He's played some off man. He's played some zone. Wasn't really asked to press, but again, that's kind of rare at either level. And he's just a really patient corner. Like when a receiver releases off the line of scrimmage and kind of tries to slow play things, that doesn't bother him. He's just going to retreat. He's going to reset the line of scrimmage and just let that guy, you know, spend all day if he has to, <laughs> you know, just kind of resetting that line of scrimmage backwards. Um, yep. So, so for us, you know, for for me, if I'm if I'm a, a staff looking at a guy who's, you know, I'm saying, okay, for us, who do we want who's going to come in and have that high floor and a decently high ceiling? It's a guy like that. Okay. And that makes a lot of sense. And something that you had said there was resetting the line of scrimmage backwards. And something that we had talked about earlier before we went live was uh, the the fact that Greg Newsom and I, I and I hold this with the the question I'm going to have for you here in just a second for uh, for Caleb Farley. Um, they have the probably the smoothest back pedal and hip transition flexibility of probably anybody in this cornerback class. Like the, their ability to to get backwards, flip their hips and turn and run, or then click and close and drive vertically on the football. That that's something that makes them a lot. More more scheme versatile just because of uh yeah they, they have the hip flexibility to turn and run in man but they can play that off zone and then drive on the football if they have to now uh kenny booker a member of the mile high huddle staff one of the newest members of uh the mile high huddle staff jumps in here and he says coach what are your thoughts on caleb farley his injuries and if he's the worst the risk to draft in the second round or just to pass on altogether yeah, and I'll I'll preface this by saying I'm not a I'm not nearly as much of a draft expert as you guys are, and I right. especially when it comes to injuries, I can't like I I don't know how to weigh those up and weigh those risks. Um, for me, for me, Caleb Farley was super super impressive. Um, he's a man corner. That's what he plays predominantly. He's gonna play play press bail. He's gonna play off man. Does a really good job of reading his keys. Super fluid hips, like you mentioned, and he does something really effectively i don't uh, there's probably a technical term for this you'd have to ask a db coach uh eric um uh, but um he does he does this thing where for a receiver when i when i'm coaching a receiver on a vertical route like in like a fade or like a, a go route i'm telling them to hold their space right i want them to be on the numbers and i don't want them to get widened off that because that amount of space between the numbers and the sideline is the room that the quarterback has to be able to place the ball so there i'm telling the receivers i'm telling them hey hold their line, hold your line, stay on that line. Don't let the cornerback widen you. Farley does an amazing job of just finding their hip and washing them, like just absolutely pushing them to the sideline, which, which doesn't leave the quarterback any space to be able to put the ball outside of them. And it's, it's a real struggle for quarterbacks then to, if they're throwing a fade, they now have, I don't know, three yards less out of eight or 10 than they did before. So that's one thing that he does really effectively is wash those receivers you know, find the hip and he ends up getting an end zone pick. I don't remember which game it was, but off of that, he ended up watching a guy so far that the only room that the quarterback had to put the ball, he was standing right there. Um, so he's, he's a really effective player. He's done a lot. He's got good click and close. He's got, you know, experience blitzing off the edge. Um, honestly, this is, I, I don't want this to come off the wrong way. I thought he was smaller than he actually is because he's not, he doesn't play big. Um, no. 
And he's not asked to. That's not the scheme, right? He's asked to be that off guy. He can, he'll line up tight, but he'll bail. Like he'll still just fluidly turn with the receiver. Um, so yeah, really good, really good player. A couple things that you'd have to refine, um, you know, kind of tweak here and there, but a really, really solid, I, and probably one of my favorite guys that I watched. Awesome. Now, when you mentioned scheme fit, and for me, corner and is one of the positions where scheme fit is probably one of the most important positions. Offensive line and corners, probably the two for me. Now, talking about Greg Newsom, talking about Caleb Farley, how do you like their fit in Vic Fangio's defense, this off-zone match quarters that he runs? Yeah. Well, with Farley, I think part of your part of your issue with him is that's not something he's ever done, right? Like he's he's an off-man guy or a press bail guy where you're telling him, hey, this is your receiver. You're covering that guy. So he hasn't necessarily been asked to play off and read through the receivers, right? Read route concepts. That's not to say he can't do it. It's just not something he was asked to do in college. And so this is one of your places where a GM or an evaluation department of scouts, they're going to have to project a guy and they're going to say, okay, is this something that we feel confident when he, we bring him in that he's going to be able to do for us in our scheme? Um, you know, I thought a couple times, the couple times that he played zone Farley, I think he needs to get his eyes back inside a little bit quicker. He's really good to pass guys, but he needs to get his eyes back a little bit faster. Um, you know, I think he's going to be a really effective man corner at the next level. I really do. Um, he plays through the receiver to the ball. Um, you know, my, my kind of takeaway with him and Eric, I know we've talked about this a little bit off air is he's, he's a cornerback who I think the offense thinks that they can throw at and he makes them regret it. Um, I think he, he looks like an easy target and he ends up really making them pay. Um, you know, as for Newsom, yeah, he's his own corner. He does a good job staying over the top of routes. That's what he does already. Um, you know, because he plays off, he doesn't have to be the best tackler in the world, but he's going to rally up and be there for a tackle. Um, and I think that's just kind of one of those things where he knows his keys. He's already kind of been coached. And, you know, as a coaching staff, are you going to take that guy who's a freak athlete, who's super aggressive around the ball? Or are you going to take that guy who's already played in a scheme like this and has some familiarity with it? Yeah. yeah, and we had a comment up about Elijah Molden. We'll get to him here in a second. There was a couple comments I wanted to get to and then some super chats. And Robert Kitchens asked, why draft the quarterback with Pat as our offensive coordinator? Another wasted year. Peyton should have fired him day one. Well, I mean, there's just a lot of different reasons for why Pat Shermer wasn't fired. And part of it is if they do run it back with Drew Locke, Drew Locke is part of the reason Pat Shermer is in town. Mm -hmm. He wanted to work with – Drew Locke, he was, as soon as he was fired, he was eyeing the Denver Broncos offensive coordinator job, especially once it opened up when Rick Scangarello was fired. So they're kind of tied hand in hand. If George Payton moved on from Pat Shermer, I have no doubt in my mind that Denver would probably be sitting at three right now looking at these quarterbacks just because you don't have a guy who's tied to the quarterback now. And I think that why Denver is looking at these quarterbacks in this class is, first of all, the talent in this class is ridiculous. Yeah. And even quarter quarterback four this year compared to other years would have been quarterback one. So you can't really compare it to other classes like that. And with that note is that they're not sure where they're going to be. They built this defense to help them win a bunch of games and they're not sure. They don't want to be five and 11 again, and it's going to cost more to move up if they're seven and nine or seven and 10, whatever it is now with 17 games. And it's going to cost more to move up, to get into a range, to get a guy and next year's quarterback class isn't as strong. Yes, some guys can rise, but for every riser, there's a faller. They're in a decent position to go up and not really sell the farm or risk the future or whatever it is, the terminology you want to use, to go get a quarterback this year. So I think they're rolling with Pat Shermer just to kind of see what he can do. And I think that part of it also is that there might be some belief that it, amongst with the fan base anyways, that Pat Shermer is getting scapegoated more than he deserves. Yeah, I... So, I, I kind of agree with that, and yeah, there 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 were some issues uh, consistently running the 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 eleven personnel stuff that the Broncos did, um, the the three wide, um, making Locke really read the entire field, that, and they they kind of transitioned from that and went to more half field reads, um, twelve personnel, two tight end sets, and stuff like that, and to try to really help Drew Locke, and he actually looked a lot better there. Um, but uh, as Eric said earlier, this quarterback class is just something different. And I'm going to take a, just a second here to kind of run through something that I, I put out on my Twitter account earlier this week. And I, I want to kind of give an explanation as to why. Um, 
obviously the top four quarterbacks, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, all of them are incredibly talented. I think they all bring something unique to their skill set, um, and they all potentially could be high-end quarterback ones in this if they develop correctly and get into that. Um, and everyone pretty much has them rated in that four that in that particular order, Wields, uh, uh, Wilson or Lawrence, uh, Wilson Fields, and then Trey Lance. I have tr uh, Justin Fields as my quarterback one in this draft class, and a part of the reason why is because I think that the arm talent that he possesses is on par with anybody in the class. I think that his ability to read the field is is good enough, and he can definitely develop in that aspect. But I, it, it, you have to get on the whiteboard and kind of see what he's what he's going through. But that's something that we're not privy to. As far as the tools and the traits and everything that he has. <clears throat> He has them all, and they're equal to what uh, Trevor Lawrence has. But the one thing that separates him from me uh, is that – he has that high end athleticism. He ran a 4.4440 at the at his pro day the other day, um, and he didn't necessarily use that to his advantage in, at Ohio State. And that Ohio State scheme, obviously the the vertical option routes that everyone wants to talk about, they don't run a lot of RPOs. They don't run a lot of the. I mean, yeah, he worked really well off the play action because they run a lot of play action there. But he they didn't run any RPOs or uh, read option stuff where they could use that athleticism. So you didn't necessarily see that on tape. But I think he has that. And if you add that to the game that he already has at this particular level and add that extra dynamic, not necessarily like a Jamar, uh, uh, Lamar Jackson, but at the same time, like Jamar, uh, Lamar Jackson, I think that you can actually turn Justin Fields into a higher ceiling player than you can Trevor Lawrence. So that's why I have Justin Fields as my quarterback one in this class <coughs> over anybody else that's there. Uh, Mark Lailingly jumping in here with a $2.99 donation. What's up, guys? Mark, good to see you back in the chat. Um, now, we, let's grab that comment from, uh, from I can't remember who it was, the, the one about Elijah Molden. And, Luke, I'm going to run this back to you. What about Elijah Molden sings to you the most? Yeah, Elijah Molden's fun, man. He's, he's an amazingly talented player. Um, for, for me, just kind of watching his film, I don't know what he is. I don't know if he's a safety. I don't know if he's a nickel. I don't think it matters. Um, for me, he's he's an amazing impact player, and I think he's he's going to be a guy who you really allow you you allow that guy to step in and have an impact for you. So a lot of what the what Washington did with him, I know they played with him with a little bit of nickel, and um, they played him primarily from what I saw at field free safety. So anytime you're in a too high structure, right? If you're in a quarters or something like that structure, that field safety ends up being predominantly your coverage safety because of the way that the, the teams will align, the boundary safety is going to end up being in the run fit. Um, so that's that's a guy who has to come down and, and make plays in the run, not to say that the field safety won't, but that guy ends up being predominantly your coverage safety. Um, sorry, go ahead. I just I just want to interject here for just a, a quick second, and I want you to break down what you're talking about as far as what does field mean versus what does boundary mean. This is a teaching football moment for everybody. So, what do you mean by that? As the safe uh, the safety on the field or the safety on the boundary? Yeah, absolutely, and I, that's really a concept that you see more at college than you do at the NFL. So, when when you're lining up the ball, you've got the hashes on the field, right? And the ball is going to be spotted anywhere between that left hash and the right hash in the middle of the field. Okay. NFL, those are the tightest possible hashes, right? There's not a lot of variation between them. College is kind of in the middle, and then high school is super wide. Um, so if you guys ever, you know, every every year when we get the Hall of Fame game up in Canton, right, they play three levels of football on that field. So there are three hashes. Um, you can see there's a lot of hashes going on on that field. For, for what I'm referring to and what football coaches will talk about with the boundary or field, the field is the, the more amount of space. Okay. It's if you're, if you're the defense and the ball is on your left hash, right? You've got more space out to the right. Okay. So that's, that's your field. That's the field side. The boundary is going to be to your left because you have basically from the hash to the sideline, as opposed to the hash to the other hash to the sideline. So, so that field safety has to operate in a lot more space. And because of that teams are going to take advantage of passing the ball to the field. So for, for him, kind of the role that he takes, he takes great angles. He's blitzed when he'll kind of roll down into the box. For me, he's a great tackler in space, which is you want what what you want, <laughs> which is what you want from a guy who's going to be that field safety or that nickel. You know, he's a guy who's comfortable mixing it up with bigger guys. He's been in the box, 
he's he he's taken on you know bigger players than him and made some tackles now that's not to say he's going to make tackles against every kind of guy um you saw in in, in the stanford game in particular their big o lineman just ate guys like him up because stanford is going to do that to you they're going to put multiple offensive linemen or tight ends like additional guys on the field and run the ball downhill at you um so for him you know, he, to me, he's a guy who, even though he's small, even though he's undersized, when he hits the ball carrier, they go backwards. Um, you know, and that for me with a, for a undersized guy like that, he's a value guy. I think day one, he comes in and he plays special teams on every unit for you. No, yeah. Eric, go ahead. Um, now I actually had a side question, not dealing with any of these corners that you watched. Do, do you know, are you familiar with Sean Wade at all out of Ohio state? Uh, peripherally, yes. Okay, so um, Kenneth Booker came in and says he was projected as a first round pick, but struggled this year. What has that to happen for him to succeed in the NFL? With you might not be able to back this up because I'm not sure how familiar you are with him or not. For me, it's he's got to move to safety. He plays so much better the farther off the line he is, and just being able to keep things in front of him and read it and have it break down in front of him is that's where he's got to be successful. Not in the boundary, not playing in the nickel, even though he can do both of those in limited action. I think that it's you want him as a safety. I wouldn't mind him as an option to replace Kareem Jackson. Kareem Jackson was originally brought in as a corner, and he had similar issues that Sean Wade did. That's kind of how I see it as being um, his way to be successful in the NFL. And then so basically I, I, and- I, want, I want to counter on you on that one just for a minute here because go back to that draft class with the, with the Ohio State uh, cornerbacks. And, yeah, everyone was pounding Sean Wade as a potential first-round pick moving up to this uh, to this next year, you know, uh, after he opted out. And I know, Eric, you were incredibly high on him uh, at one point. Yep. Um, but look at who he had – when he was playing as that nickel cornerback – and he had two dogs on the outside. I mean, he had Jeff Okuda on one side and Damon Arnett on the other side. So when you're looking at, at Sean Wade and that, that secondary and what they had, I don't remember who the safeties were. Uh, forgive me for that. But when you have two guys on the outside and they're taking everything away on the outside and you just have to take away that tertiary receiver and that high end athleticism that he had, he took a step back this year for sure because he was a primary focus guy. Like he was the, the guy that was going against number one wide receivers, playing on the boundary a lot, um, playing in. In, in some more press man stuff, which he doesn't necessarily seem comfortable in. Um, I think that's a big reason that he kind of took a step back this year. Now, Eric, I do completely and totally agree with you. Get him further away from the ball, let him play that safety, let him read and react and stuff like that. Um, I, I also like him better in a nickel. And I think that a big part of that was because that that Ohio State secondary, not, not this past year, but the year before, the tw- that 2020 secondary, was actually a, 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 an incredibly high-end unit. To, I mean, Damon Arnett was drafted in the second round. He was probably should have been a third round player, but Jeffrey Okuda was a top five cornerback. Like you have some dogs around you to take some take some of that pressure off of you and and maybe cover up some, for some of your mistakes. Yeah, I definitely definitely agree with that. I mean, it wasn't easy because they had they still have talent in their secondary, but not that caliber of talent. Right, they still have to develop and get there. So yeah, that definitely played an issue. But when I watched him and broke him down this year. There was just a lot of technical lapses. He just didn't seem to have the desire as much as he did a year ago. Some issues with physicality. Just all these issues of it that go beyond just the talent leaving the th- um, the talent leaving the uh, the squad. And I want to get to base que- based Gase's question here, who because he's got the best uh, profile pick on this, of course, with the Adam Gase, who thank God he's no longer in the NFL. But as draft analysts, how do you combat the hive mind in the draft community and prospect fatigue? Um, my what I do is I don't pay attention. <laughs> That's the best way to put it is I don't read what other people put out about draft prospects, not even Lance, not Nick, not anyone else. We talk privately about it and I'll talk to people privately. I'll talk to people on Twitter, but if they post an article, I, I don't read it. Um, I, I don't like, I try not to have my opinions on prospects um, uh, influenced by any, by anybody else. It's what I see, what I break down watching their tape, how I come away thinking of them. And then prospect fatigue, if um, after a certain point, it's just, I just stop. I mean, it's I move on to different things. It's why I go from position to position because I don't want to get fatigued watching just one position. Don't want to get fatigued watching the same same prospect. I don't, I don't sit there and watch all five games or however many games I'm watching of a prospect at once. I kind of split it up over, over a couple weeks and everything like that. 
Um, so yeah, I just just little different things I do, but the biggest one is for the hive mind. I just don't pay attention. The the hive mind and I I jump into this really bad with Richard Grant just because I I mean we stand Grant in this household. You should all know that it should be a hashtag by this point. Uh, we stand Grant in this household, and I I've been a big fan of Richard Grant for a long time. Um, and there are some times where you'll, you'll see, you know, I, I do appreciate the hive mind mentality. I'm a little bit different than Eric on this one because it does open your mind up to some different possibilities. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily lead you into a group think, but it might open your mind up to a, a, a different way of viewing a certain player. So uh, to me, like, for example, Richie Grant, I, I love the the physicality, the aggression. We all already know how I feel about him. But uh, let's say like a, a Joseph Osai. Eric will say, you know, hey, a, a Joseph Osai, he does this, he does this. Let's go check him. Out. All right. Well, I'll go check him out. Uh, then I might see another one like this Jameen Davis hive that's all of a sudden come out of nowhere. And it's like, well, oh, all right, let's go check out Jameen Davis. So it gives me an idea of who to watch and who to like maybe get some different opinions on, but it doesn't necessarily influence the way that I feel about a player. I don't necessarily like Jameen Davis as a first round talent. However, he seems to be that that new trendy pick as that next first round linebacker. I, I honestly view him as a third round pick, well, but that's that there's a certain extent to it where, yeah, I, I appreciate the hive mind, but also at the same time, I don't necessarily pay attention to it. I can tell you why you're wrong about Jameen Davis being a first round pick. And it's something that Luke actually said. He's an athlete. Yeah, uh, uh, he's got he's got to learn the football side of it. He's an athlete yep. that's got to learn the football side of it. No, I I, 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 I totally see it, but it's it, again, it goes back to that. I, I look for the the tools and the traits and stuff like, and athleticism is part of that. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, there there are some things that I don't think that he does well. I don't think he has the banger mentality. I don't think that he's good in his run well, fits. I think that style. he's two hundred and twenty five pounds. Not, exactly, not but the, but there's there's some things to his game that don't translate to this next level. He's going to have to figure that kind of stuff out. So there, I mean, it's, that's true. With it, it's, Picking hairs. Exactly. It, it, <laughs> exactly. And some people are going to like other players better than, than, than I am. And I'm going to like players, uh, other players better. Uh, hence my Justin Fields take, but at the same time, like there's, there are some things that you can, that you can take advantage of with the hive mind um, that where you can open your mind to new different possibilities and also be able to refine your takes just a little bit. Um, prospect fatigue, uh, I'm different on Eric on this one. I actually like to watch three or four games in a row of a certain player just so I can see that over and over again. Um, but then you also, the, the, the hard part of that is you grind yourself into a rut and it makes it hard to differentiate the good from the bad. You continue to see the good and you don't see the bad, or you continue to see the bad and then you don't see the good. Luke, what do you think? Well, first and foremost, I have a, I have a hot Adam Gase take here which is that I've I've always looked up to Adam Gase in a way because he's the only NFL head coach I can think of who never played college football. Um, I, I'm not even sure he played in high school. And as someone, Belichick? Uh, Belichick played. Um, he? he was yep. at um, Wesleyan. or He's some Northeast school. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he's one of the few guys up until very recently who, who never played in high school. And as someone who didn't myself, I look up to him. So well, okay. watch, your, watch your talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky because you want to you want to be able to have enough in your brain um, when you watch a guy that you kind of get a feel for him. You know, is he is he a guy who's you know doing this or doing that? And you can kind of start to notice those little patterns kind of the more you watch him. Um, but at the same time, it is important to ta sometimes take a step back and come back after a couple of days with fresh eyes. Um, you know, I think, you know, for me you know, college football is, is four months and it's a, it's a grind. You know, I, I will go in and I will watch the same team for six days, play them on the seventh and then watch the same team for six days and play them on the set. Like it is a routine week after week where I don't have options for fatigue. Like I, nobody cares, get a game plan done. Um, and, you know, thinking back to my days when I actually did get to, to cover the draft and to talk about draft stuff regularly, you know, I think the hive is the hive, you know, draft Twitter is a living, breathing entity. There's going to, you know, I remember days yep. when there would just suddenly the timeline would be talking about one guy. Nobody knows how that started, but everybody's talking about one guy guessing that hasn't changed. That's probably still the same. And the yep. draft industrial complex, the media complex surrounding the draft, like, there are always people talking like about different players, about different teams. There are always implicit biases. You know, nobody likes Wisconsin wide receivers, but they love Wisconsin O-linemen. Like there's always things like that that you you just kind of subconsciously or unconsciously or consciously buy into and, you know, that that impacts you. So, yeah, I think it's important to kind of let, you know, your own analysis drive what you see. And, you know, if you look at someone's, 
perspective or scouting report on a player and it is significantly different than your own, then it's important for you to say, Hey, why is that the case? What am I missing or what are they missing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And just to clarify with when I don't read is I, I read what they say on Twitter. I reinteract with them on Twitter. I don't read the articles just because with, with a lot of times over the years, especially with Nick is talking with him. And even before Nick with Luke, we would talk about prospects and we would, uh, and I'd go back and watch them because I see something differently than they do. And I go and try to prove them wrong and sometimes end up proving myself that my take was wrong, things like that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always a thing of you got kind of got to use the, um, use the hives and everything like that. But uh, you, you, it's, just got to find that balance of not letting it influence your opinion. And we, I know we asked you about multiple to watch multiple other corners. So um, before we get to the last super chats and have to get out of here, why don't you give us some quick thoughts on the other corners that we, we had you watch um, Patrick Sertain, uh, Eric Stokes and the Syracuse uh, duo. Yeah. And one thing actually, just before I get to them, one thing that, that Farley and Newsom kind of had in common that I actually didn't really like link while mentioning the two of them before both of them, and this is kind of an interesting scheme thing. Both of them got a tray formation to their side. So what I say when I when I say tray is one tight end and then three receivers opposite. Okay, so one running back in the backfield, a tight end to them to the boundary, and then three receivers to the field. And basically, when an offense does that, it's for one of two reasons. One, they're trying to waste a corner who's really good at coverage, and so all they're giving him there in a zone scheme, they're putting a tight end to his side. And they're saying, look, we don't care if you're covering the tight end because we can put one of our really good uh, receivers in this in the slot to the other side and match them up on the linebacker or match them up on a safety. That's good a stuff. win for us. Or two, the offense says, hey, we don't think you can tackle that effectively in the run game. And so we're going to be able to run the ball effectively to that side with the tight end. You're probably going to have to get off either a tight ends block if he's kind of coming up to you at the second level or – an offensive lineman's block. Either way, we're gambling on the fact that we don't think you're going to make a tackle in the run game. And the the snaps that I saw for both of those guys were passes. So that kind of tells you it's probably not the latter. Yeah. Um, so that's just kind of a scheme thing that like with college, you'll say, hey, let's waste this cornerback. Let's make sure that we keep him there and that we're not throwing the ball in his direction. Um, you know, the other guys, I know, you know, you had me watch Patrick Sertain. He's such an Alabama football player, man. He's so patient. He's so well coached. He's an athlete. You know, he's someone who teams really didn't kind of try to throw the ball at him unless they knew they had a true number one receiver. Um, if they did throw the ball at him, otherwise it's with picks, it's mesh, things that they can use to really disrupt his path and really kind of throw off his track with the receiver. Um, he's really aggressive taking on blocks. He plays through swing screens really quickly and he does a good job as i mentioned before of compressing those receivers into the sideline of making sure that they run out of space um eric stokes from georgia he's one of those guys where you're gambling on athleticism man he's not necessarily the most polished football player right now obviously lightning quick i've seen some insane numbers from his 40 you know i i can't speak to whether or not those are true because they're pro day numbers and i think everyone's learning that a pro day number doesn't mean much these days well wow. but yeah, but you know he's 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 a really really athletic football player, and and I think that allows him to get away with some stuff. He's a little bit sloppy technique wise, not the best tackler in the world. He kind of stops his feet and doesn't initiate the tackler. And if he's beat off the line, he has the recovery speed to be able to get back and make a play. Um, you know, when you talk about field versus boundary, field corners in college. They're guys who have to be able to operate in space. They've got to have recovery speed. Boundary corners tend to be a little bit bigger. They tend to have to be a little bit more physical because they're working with not as much space. He's a field corner in college, right? He's the guy who you have to play in space because you know he has recovery speed to make a play if he's beaten. Um, do you want me to pause? Do you want me to kind of talk about the last three guys? I mean, I can uh, go all night. Well, <laughs> I, I want to I want to grab this question really fast from Call of Judy. It's a super chat here, and it's a it's an amazing amazing question. Before we get into Trill Williams and if if you ought to Um what are some issues that a corner can fix, and what are uh, some issues that corners can't? That is a great question. Um, and honestly, as a coach, you're, you're kind of trying to figure that stuff out yourself. Um, you know, when you're looking at a guy, um, 
you know, athleticism, you can't like, like Eric said, you can't coach athleticism, either you have it or you don't. But one thing that you'll see a lot of guys really improve with, whether it's making the jump from high school to college or college to NFL is footwork. You know, they, they can have really sloppy footwork like a guy like Stokes and just have amazing athleticism to be able to compensate and make up for those mistakes. Um, you know, something that you'll see a lot is the term EDD, everyday drill. Basically, they're drills that teams will do every day in practice, either in warmups or kind of to start practice. And for DBs, that is literally you will put them on a yard line. They will backpedal down that yard line. You'll have them flipping their hips, rotating, kind of taking off, things like that. Little footwork drills like that, working shuffles, working back pedals, working scooches. You know, it's it's all kinds of things like that. If a guy stops his feet when he's pressing and lunges and gets off balance, you can coach that. Um, you know, things like that are, are easy to adapt, you know, much less scheme keys, who you're reading through. Like if you're keying number twos released from outside, you know, things like that tend to be a lot easier to coach than you can't coach a guy to be faster. You can't like there's no NFL coach in the world that's going to turn a four, seven guy into a four, three guy ain't going to happen. Nah, that's that's a great point, man. I really do appreciate that. Uh, before we, we, we're gonna have to make this kind of quick. If you want to talk some Syracuse cornerbacks, uh, sorry, Eric, I know you had kind of a specific question there. Um, uh, what do you think about Trill Williams and uh, if you to Melifonwu? Yeah, well, well, Trill Williams, he's he's interesting because he's kind of like Elijah Molden in that he's done a little bit of everything. Um, you know, because he's that cover down is the what kind of the term that you'll hear a lot. He's that overhang. He's that nickel player, right? Because he's in that situation, he has to be very communicative. He he basically sets the tone for the defense for the defense covering that's that part of the field. So he does a really good job of talking. You can tell when he's passing a receiver in zone. Um, he does a good job playing receivers who, who stem, who come at him vertically. And as a result, because he's, because he's able to do that, he's really effective at his job. You know, he's aggressive rerouting. He knocks guys off their courts, uh, courses, um, and he's he's athletic. Um, you know, I'd love to see him chase down plays a little bit more from the backside. But, you know, because he's the overhang and this is kind of getting into some really technical football stuff. A lot of time in college to the field, you're going to have teams that will basically what's called gap out that overhang. Effectively, they're making sure he doesn't have a gap. He's not in the run fit. He's not a guy who has to play both the receiver and the run, because what are you going to get in college? RPOs, right? You're going to put that guy in conflict between trying to play the run and trying to play a receiver. Right. So he does a good job within their scheme. He doesn't have to play the run. He has to play the receiver, and he still does a really good job still being a force player and redirecting everything inside of him. Man, um, that's High quality information. Sorry to cut you off there. High no, 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 quality no. information. You're good. Um, Melifonu, man, he's he's super violent. He's just aggressive in everything he does. Gets off of gets off of wide receivers. Really fluid hips. He does a great job widening the receiver. And you know he's disruptive at the catch point. He plays through the receiver. Doesn't give any receivers an easy catch. Um, and because he's got that experience playing man. He's really comfortable turning his back on the quarterback and just keying the receiver, which is, you know, you'll get guys who play man coverage who are just keying a receiver and they they're not comfortable. Like they they don't know kind of where they're at on the field. Right. Or they're kind of difficult. They have some difficulties tracking a receiver. He's confident in that man. He is he is a true press man corner because he can do all of that effectively. Now, his physicality is going to help him if you have a team that's a cover two team where he's going to play through to the flat and Again, because he's so confident, I have every expectation he'd be able to walk in and, you know, anywhere and pick up any kind of zone defense elements. Yeah. Good stuff, man. So, Always. My, my final question for you is with Denver's defense, the corners that we had you watch, how would you rank them in terms of their scheme fit and uh, and uh, all that? How, how would you rank them? And come on, you knew you knew you were going to get something. It, this I, this, was, this is a this is a prototypical question for if we're going to bring you on to to rank <laughs> some guys. We had you running backs last year and wide receivers. You got to give us your your cornerback rankings this year. I know, man. I know. Well, and I think part of this is you know again not being a guy who necessarily scouts cornerbacks or, or coaches them specifically. You know, ranking them as a player versus as a scheme fit. You know, right off the bat, I'm I'm going to be honest. I'm going to discard, discard Trill Williams and Elijah Molden because I see them as slots or as safeties, and I don't really think that that is a true outside corner. Um, 
in terms of fit, I think Newsom is your best fit. He's he's great at reading through his own combinations. It's something he's already done in college. Like he's he has done this for years. He's comfortable with it. He stays over the top of receivers. He's just a really good zone corner. Um, my favorite out of the rest, I loved Caleb Farley, man. He's incredibly technical. He does some things that you're going to need to coach him up on. Um, what we call a kind of a crack and replace, where if he has a, a, a corner, excuse me, if he's the corner and the receiver pushes up and instead blocks the safety, basically what he needs to do in man coverage is then fold back out and get to the run fit. Um, he does that. He he needs to do that better. And that's one thing that, you know, he won't necessarily have to do as much if he's reading through receivers, but it's something he's going to have to fix. Um, I, I know I kind of touched on this earlier. Farley for me is the guy who an offense thinks they can throw at and makes the mistake of doing that. Patrick Sertain, he's the guy that the offense knows better to than to throw at. So if, you know, you know, without getting too much in the weeds here, <sighs> gun to my head, I'd probably go Newsom Farley, Melifon Moose certain again if I was a DB's coach Stokes would probably be a little bit higher but for me right now where he's at as a football player I don't think because because he's that athlete because he's a little bit sloppy I just I I would want a coach in place who's really going to be able to handle you know a, an athlete like him as a football player purely right now I don't think he's there yet Man, that's interesting. You so so you went uh, Newsom Farley uh, Melifonu Sertan. Yes, right. Correct. Holy cow, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's preaching to some choirs here. I'm telling you what, man. It, I was it, gonna say, am I part of the hive now? Like I I, well, I can't uh, tell. I don't know I, if that's like the the prevailing opinion or not. I'm just well, I'm shooting off the hip here, man. So I'll just put it this way: your your title as my daughter's godfather is secure for now. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 I definitely made it another year. Let's go. <laughs> it's it's definitely up there, man. Uh, like neither one of us are high on Sertan just because we think he's so limited athletically in what he does. Uh, it just it like scheme. He's not scheme versatile. Um, it, and I mean he is very limited into that press man coverage. We talked about it earlier. He's just a press man coverage cornerback that turns and runs well, but he's not going to click and close on the football. So that to me just drops him down. I value versatility incredibly well. And I, I mean, uh, Newsom, I, I would go Farley Newsom, but it, I mean, it, and that's just picking hairs at this point. Um, I'm, I'm only putting there, him there because the scheme fit. Like in a vacuum, if I'm starting a scheme from day one, I want Caleb Farley. Right. For this scheme in particular, I'm taking Newsom. So. And I, uh, and I don't disagree and, with you, and neither does Eric, because Eric, I do believe, has uh, uh, Greg Newsom as cornerback one in this class. Yeah. And I just want to clarify that this is looking – or clarify that this is looking purely on the football field, not factoring in Farley's medical stuff because, like us, like Lance and I, Luke, we just don't have that information about where his back is at. Yep. His agent gave some promising stuff so that there, that everything's all clear there. Still expect him to go in the first round, but that is definitely a concern. So this is looking specifically at what they're doing on the football field. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I, I, I do want to put out there that I'm not the greatest at that kind of a judge of, uh, I mean, the character concerns, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, injury concerns, so long as they're not coming off of a, uh, like, uh, say like Cameron McGrone, the linebacker out of Michigan, um, that is actually coming off of a torn ACL this year. That impacts me more. And I mean, the Caleb Farley stuff with, with the back injury, um, yeah, that, that's concerning to me. But also, I, I grade players based on their tape and then go into a would I take them here because of this concern? Um, Caleb Farley to me is the, is the top graded cornerback in this class. Would I take him at number nine overall? Probably not because of the injury concern, but that, that injury concern doesn't affect my grade on him as cornerback one. He still is cornerback one. I don't necessarily know that I would take him at nine. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Luke, do you have anything to say on that? No, I mean, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head that, you know, for us, his, his injury concerns are kind of an unknown commodity. Um, and for an NFL team, they're not going to spend a, a first round pick, much less any other pick, unless they've done their their medical and injury history on a guy. Um, I will say, you know, I know I didn't put him on my board of, of guys just then, but Elijah Molden's an amazing football player from a, a team that has really consistently produced some top tier NFL DBs. Again, that's the that's the draft bias in me talking, but Washington, but Washington has put some really good DBs in out there recently. Yeah. Um. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say real quick, like if I'm a coach, if I'm a GM, that's a guy I would pound a table for. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with there, especially with what Vic Fangio does. Like, I've been saying it for a long time that Elijah Molden is a guy that I would love to have in this defense. You can play him as that safety nickel that you were talking about. And with Bryce Callahan being up after this year and his injury issues, I, I, I would absolutely love that pick somewhere in the second round. And spoiler, in my final mock draft, Elijah Molden is actually a second round pick for the Denver Broncos. Yes, he now, is. Now, one comment here before we have to get out of here. Jay Kozit says, I don't know going into the season, Shermer's seat is hot. I know during the chat, uh, during the show, the chat was talking about Pat Shermer quite a bit. He says, Peyton has a relationship with him, but if they go 0 and 4, they probably have to move on. Um, Pat Shermer's seat is extremely hot going into the season. Um, but he, it probably was a lot closer to moving on from him than many people are many people think or realize or whatever terminology you want to use there. I think it was close to happening. Didn't happen. I think a seat is hot and um, just, uh, yeah, if if they're, if they're going for and the offense is struggling, I would not be shocked if Pat Shermer is fired and drew lock is benched. If he's the starting quarterback. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that one. Um, And especially if the Broncos go and draft a rookie, uh, if, the, if the Broncos go and, and get a Justin Fields or they go in and get a Trey Lance in the first round, they go up and get a guy and lock in the offense is struggling and everything. It would not surprise me to see um, Pat Shermer get, get let go um, and he'd probably get fired and drew lock sent to the bench and they would promote like Mike Shula, the quarterbacks coach and whoever that would be say Justin Fields, um, Mike Shula and Justin Fields would get promoted up. Um, Fields would be the starter at, at the quarterback position and, and Mike Shula would be calling plays. Uh, that would not surprise me. Um, Jake King here before we run the matters of business, uh, just quick answer for me, Eric here, uh, with a $5 super chat is Davis mills, the best quarterback outside of the top five. The best quarterback right now? No. Is he the one with the most upside? I think so. Um, I'm going to rebut this by saying that I actually have Davis Mills above Mac Jones in my quarterback rankings because I do believe in that upside. So let's just end it right there. Uh, If you guys want to check out my quarterback rankings, go to – you can find me at Sanderson uh, (laughs) MHH. I'm going to start doing that, Lance. I'm going to start saying, here's my take. All right, we're done. Yeah, we're done. (laughs) I I like that. I like that. Yeah, that, that, no, I, I've I've been listening to a lot of sports talk radio here, so I'm trying to figure out that that can, that nice balance of being a podcaster and being a radio show host. So we're gonna run into the break here. Here's my hot take. Now think about it for a minute, so I can come back. Anyways, no, uh, for real, those guys, uh, we're over our hour mark, and we got to get out of here. I have family here in town, and I've got to go uh, attend to on that. Um, first things first, before we get out of here, thank you, Luke, for joining us. Uh, you guys find Luke at Luke Polglaze on Twitter. Um, amazing follow if he actually does put anything out on his Twitter account but he always is has very insightful stuff and again uh, the, everything you put out here we appreciate you man thank you thank you my, very much oh it's a pleasure as always guys thanks for for still having me back um you know after after all these times of, of spitting out controversial takes I'm glad I finally had one that that landed and was a little bit closer to home <laughs> that you guys can get on board with um so no the pleasure was mine thank you guys no, nah, man, you're, you're good. We, we, we appreciate it. And as uh, Gary Leeds come in here saying a great insight is one of the best pods that he's ever seen. Um, uh, let's, let's r- run these matters of business here. Uh, guys, thank you all for joining the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. You guys can find me on Twitter at Sanderson MHH for Eric at Eric Trickle, obviously for Luke at Luke Polglaze. Uh, spell Luke with L U C, not L U C K. Um, if you're listening to this after the, after the podcast, um, also, guys, while you're at it, let me pull up the banners here. Uh, while you're at it, follow at DVDD underscore pod. Um, that's the – who is playing with the controls here? There we go. Uh, at DVDD underscore pod. Uh, that's the, the podcast account. Uh, it's the easiest way to keep up with what's going on with the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Um, also, while you're at it, at Mile High Huddle. That is the mother account. That's where you get instant news and analysis, breaking news, um, of opinion articles, film breakdowns from your favorite Mile High Huddle personalities, including myself and Eric, uh, Nick, Carl, Luke, uh, Chad, Zach, everybody at Mile High Huddle. All of that news and analysis comes at Mile High Huddle on Twitter. Easiest way to keep up with also what's going on with the Huddle Up Podcast Network, including the Dove Valley Deep Divers, Building the Broncos with Nick and Carl, uh, Mile High Insiders with uh, Nick and Luke, and then also the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad and Zach. With, uh, easy way to keep up with everything going on regarding your Denver Broncos. Uh, Facebook users. 
specifically to Facebook users here, uh, facebook.com slash mile high huddle, click the blue, uh, the blue become a supporter button and check out what Eric has going on, on the, uh, the, the trickle zone, Eric, what's going on on the trickle zone this weekend? Well, this weekend we're going to be talking about, well, last weekend we talked about the offensive side and the trenches, the offensive line. This week we're flipping sides. We're going to be talking about the defensive line and the edges. I believe it's my top 10 edge rushers and my top five interior defensive linemen because this class isn't a super strong one. So definitely head on over there on for the trickle zone and then Kelberman's Corner as well on Sundays and then the other stuff that we have coming on. And real quick, I just got to point out that it for, for Luke, it's L-U-C, not L-U-K-E, not L-U-C-K. That's no, not I- yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, not luck, not luck, not luck. L U C, L U C, please. Uh, anyways, to to continue to continue us getting getting done with this show. Uh, let's see here. Uh, huddleuppod.com, guys. If you guys are financially able to be able to do so, and head on over to huddleuppod.com. That's the merch tent. I don't have my Dove Valley Deep Divers hat on today. Like I said, I got home really late and was kind of rushed to get to the podcast. But there's hats, there's t-shirts, there's hoodies, uh, face masks. You, there's a coffee cup, a onesie for your baby if you want it. Something for the guys, something for the gals. Uh, anything to suit your fancy. Huddleuppod.com. Get your merch on. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, don't forget to to head over to manscaped.com. Use the promo code HUDDLE for uh, 20% off and free shipping uh, for anything you want at manscaped.com. And the three easiest things you guys can do to help support the show, if you're not interested in heading over to uh, to becoming a Facebook supporter, super chatting, um, even heading over to the merch store, whatever it may be, uh, subscribe. Wherever you guys are watching this, on YouTube, on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, um, after the fact on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, I subscribe to Mile High Huddle. You're going to get everything that we do at the Huddle Up Podcast Network there. Like every video you guys see. Again, YouTube especially. Like all of these videos. And if you guys love it, share it. Get it out and in front of as many Broncos fans as humanly possible. Those are the three most organic ways that you can uh, help grow the podcast. And, and again, just help us do what we do best, which is cover your Denver Broncos. Now, guys, before we get out of here, Eric, I got to ask you, as always, any last words? Well, yeah, we got one late super chat. And Call of Duty says, with a $2.99 donation, we appreciate that. He says, they called me crazy for having Newsome number one. Well, if you're crazy for that, I'm crazy right there with you. Yeah. I, but I, uh, I just want to say uh, thanks to Luke for coming on and joining the show. We definitely want to have you on again in the future. And uh, hopefully next time you continue this trend of giving good takes and ones that we agree with. And, uh, and just uh, hope to have you on again in the future talking – Probably more specifically Denver Broncos sometime after the draft, maybe before the season. Yeah, man, it's, it's great to have you. Any, anything else from you? Yeah, maybe maybe next time you guys will let me talk about the good side of the ball instead of the defense. But no, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> hey, um, you, yeah. you know what? You, you know what? No, let's 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 try to get you on here uh, shortly after the draft. And I know you're going to be busy doing um, doing stuff with with your uh, the coaching process and stuff like that. Uh, let's let's get back in touch with each other here soon and see if we can't get you a, a breakdown of like a, a Jerry Judy and uh, some of the things that he did in his rookie season. That what do you think about that? Yeah, it'd be my pleasure, guys. Um, I'm sure that the Broncos will draft some kind of offensive skill player who I may or may not have some lukewarm takes about at some point in the draft. So yeah, I'd love <laughs> to come back, guys. Uh, yeah, man, uh, absolutely. I, again, guys, uh, shout out to Luke Polglaze for joining the show. Uh, for Eric, I'm Lance. You all, thanks, thank you all once again for joining the Dove Valley Deep Divers. You all stay safe. Uh, take care. Have a great rest of your weekend. And as I always say before we sign off, go Broncos. Same time, uh, same place next week.